Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's great to speak uh, here with all of you. Uh, City and LSC have had a very long-standing relationship. Many of our greatest leaders and biggest contributors at City uh, have come from LSC, and today I look forward to your questions from this outstanding set of students. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the financial architecture that's going to serve your generation in the future. When I was in the city about nine months ago, I spoke at the British Bankers Association, and back then, which was early on, I suggested we really needed a serious rethink of global financial architecture, uh, and particularly driven by the fact I thought it was inadequate. What we had today was inadequate for the modern times, and certainly looking back at what happened with Lehman, looking back at the events that followed major recapitalizations of some of the largest banks in the world, and for that matter, the recession that's concurrent with all those events, it's pretty clear that, that we have a lot of work to do. Most importantly, when a financial crisis spills out and impacts the lives of people around the world, it's clear that we need to rethink the events, not only the events that caused uh, where we are, but we, we need to rethink the global financial architecture that got us here in the first place. And in reality, we never really had a global architecture. Instead, we've been riding on a high-speed train, but on, lay, on rails that were laid more than 60 years ago for a simpler, slower-paced world. Government regulatory mechanisms and private sector managers had capacity limitations that could not handle the rapidly accelerating pace and volume of new financial products. And eventually, our high-speed train exceeded the system's capacity to control it. For me personally, to lead city in these exceptional times has been a humbling and sobering experience. Many of the colleagues that we've had in global financial centers around the world have lost their jobs, and historic institutions have shut their doors. And for that matter, the very, very bedrock of the principles of capitalism has been shaken. And the world is watching, quite literally, what we in the banking community are doing on a daily basis. And I, as I mentioned to the members of U.S. Congress only a couple of weeks ago, I get the new reality, and I make sure that Citi gets it as well. Since I became CEO at Citi in December 2007, we've been taking steps to achieve a rapid return to profitability and to be part of the solution to the problems we're facing in the financial community. We're not only restructuring our company and reworking our internal systems of risk management, but we're also collaborating with governments in ways we never anticipated because we are a major systemic financial institution. And I'll say more about Citi a little bit later, but I want to be very clear that we at Citi recognize that we must be a leader in helping to shape the new global financial architecture. We are keenly aware that hundreds of millions of people are expecting us to deliver. Many exceptional people, scholars, government officials, private sector experts are contributing to the multilateral discussion about the new global financial framework. Thankfully, a renewed political will articulated through the G20 heads of state has moved decisively beyond what we thought were going to be tactical and technical discussions to one that's considerably more strategic, more transparent, and more inclusive. I believe the net result will be a global system that is far better understood, much better regulated, and much better appreciated. That said, we clearly are in early stages of an exercise, and this exercise can still fall short of an, effect, of an effective solution. Which leads me to a crucial point, especially for all of us today. The work we're doing now, the reshaping of global financial markets in the next few years will have an extraordinary impact on the potential for raising living standards, improving quality of life, and confronting urgent global issues over the next 50 years. We cannot underestimate the scale of the impact. In my view, this is a paradigm shift, and this is the shift that will determine how well the global resetting is managed. It will be one of the defining historical events of my generation, and for that matter, your generation as well. I believe, along with many others who are directly involved, 
three issues are critical to the creation of 21st century global regulatory system. First, we need a regulatory structure that will allow markets to clear efficiently. Second, we need a financial architecture that can truly optimize global GDP growth. And third, we clearly need a lot of global coordination. Let me start with the regulatory structure. And we all understand the regulatory debate is complex, but to me it is clear that it should not be about rebalancing between governments and the free markets. The debate needs to be about how we design regulation and market architecture that allows free markets to flourish while still being systemically responsible. It's a question of how tightly you hold a canary in your hand. Let me be clear, we do need regulations to make market works, markets work better. The place to start is by regulating transparency. Transparent markets generally work, and in this particular case, partial regulation is not the second best answer. Of course, the pushback to this view is always that there is self-interest in free markets, and the markets need self-interest to work, uh, and that is unavoidable. Not only that, we need it. Self-interest is a driver of creativity and innovation and wealth creation, but self-interest does need checks and balances. Markets can do that extremely well as being arbiters and by clearing trades, but that can only happen if there is transparency. Many fundamental parts of our financial markets remain opaque. For some reason, they have been shielded in different ways from the information revolution. In addition, individuals generally have no incentive to seek transparency. Market participants need access to trading information, volumes, open interest, financial information that is easily understood. At the international level, we need to ensure that institutions created to manage the process have the tools and the mandate to maintain the transparency needed for more efficient market behavior. Let me turn to the issue of level playing field a system for uniform and consistent measurement. Clearly one of the biggest challenges for developing a unified international regulatory regime is measurement. Good accounting policies and consistent capital requirements are critical to measurement, amongst other things. Good accounting policy, globally considered and globally applied, is essential for stable markets that encourage investment, innovation, and growth. Right now, I believe we don't have that. We don't even have consistent capital requirements globally, which creates an unlevel playing field and leads to behavior that it increases systemic risk. In addition, our accountants, accounting systems can work better. There is a significant divergence between economics and accounting. Accounting rules do not necessarily capture economic value. Nowhere is this clearer than in the measurement of capital supporting businesses. As economists and well-trained and savvy mathematicians, all of you here at LSC know that any capital in any organization can be measured by using contingent claims analysis. Contingent claims analysis looks at current and future cash flow, net realizable values, both on the asset side but also on the liability side, and brings this back to the present the present being the value of the enterprise. This approach recognizes that the value of an asset is not entirely independent of the liability funding it. Confusion arises when we treat assets and liabilities separately or just think about the value of assets and completely ignore liabilities. The two formats for financial institutions where current policies work best are for a trading firm that carries liquid tradable assets and a firm that's therefore funded also by wholesale liquid and tradable liabilities. It's clear in these kind of firms you can use mark-to-market -market accounting and it should apply. Current accounting also works in pure banks where it makes sense to have total accrual accounting because long-term assets are funded with stable long-term deposits and therefore, what matters is realized and expected losses, not liquidity. This is also an example where accounting works in an asset liability matched application. 
where accounting stops working is when we have deposits that fund tradable assets, particularly when only one side of the balance sheet is marked to market, or when we have wholesale funds that fund accrual assets. In both of these cases, accounting and economics diverge significantly. Over the last year and a half, billions of dollars of capital in the banking system have been impacted by various accounting rules, including this asset liability mismatch. The debate is not whether to mark to market or not. It's about applying a consistent contingent claims analysis to truly understand the capitalization of banks. Lastly, let me turn to the need for overarching systemic regulators. Regardless of what we do, not every market will be transparent. Not every financial product or risk can be quantified in a way that allows markets to clear. This is when regulators need to step in and aggregate information to make sure that actions and self-interest still manage to drive a consistent result for the economy. We've also seen that in times of stress, just about any meaningful financial institution is systemically important. We must therefore cast a very wide net around many financial institutions and activities. And I really want to hear your point of view on these three issues, transparency, creating a level playing field, and the need for systemic regulators. I know that Sir Howard has written extensively on regulatory architectures, especially on what is needed in the EU in terms of systemic surveillance. I also want to hear the thoughts about what you consider the right architecture to be for driving optimal GDP growth. Let me turn to that for a minute. Historically, bank lending created, or rather bank lending funded credit creation. You all know at Student of Economics that over the past 20 years or so, finance companies and securitization markets surpassed banks in providing most of the credit growth, particularly in the US and particularly to fund small and medium enterprises, entrepreneurs, innovative industries. And this finance company and securitization phenomena was often beyond the reach of banking regulators. As we think about designing the new architecture, we need to ask, how much global GDP growth do we desire or should we have? How much credit creation does that level of GDP growth require? Is the funding available for that desired level of credit? Is there funding available for that desired level of credit creation? And I think what you will find is when you do the analysis, it is clear that, that there are not enough bank deposits in the world to support the credit requirements to drive optimal GDP growth around the world. And to create, therefore, this opportunity for growth, we need alternative credit creation vehicles, such as securitization markets, to remain vital and flourishing. Global regulators are taking aggressive steps to unfreeze these types of markets. In the US, the Treasury and the Federal Reserve recently announced a program to unfreeze the securitization markets. The program, called TALF, uh, is Term Asset-Backed Securities Loan Facility. This is a program that will provide approximately a trillion dollars to increase credit availability to consumers in the US. But many of these programs that are designed to jumpstart securitizations and alternative ways of credit creation may turn out to be temporary solutions. And we need to think about permanent long-term solutions. And it's very likely that such solutions are going to require a helping hand. One of the most important legacies we're leaving behind for all of you as risk managers and all of you as finance experts in the future is a wonderful stress test that you're going to apply to everything from here on. As a matter of fact, uh, if you apply this stress test to a lot of the business models and risk-taking activities, such as securitization or finance companies and or many other financial services organization, the numbers would suggest that the cost of running these or the equity requirements against funding these structures may turn out to be prohibitively expensive. And so as we think about jumpstart and credit creation, it's very important for us to understand the short-term steps are important, but we're going to have to address something more fundamental to create an architecture that will deliver the level of credit creation for us to drive GDP growth. 
The most interesting thing is this is not the first time this has happened. And I, I hate to go back and talk about the American Depression, but let me do that anyway. Uh, the U.S. government during the American Depression established federal deposit insurance. And this was in recognition of the fact that you needed deposits to create credit and people weren't willing to provide deposits in the banks because it wasn't clear that deposits would be safe. And so the concept of deposit insurance was created. And this was an important thing in an era where deposits funded credit creation. In today's market, deposits don't account for much of the credit creation. As a matter of fact, wholesale funding drives credit creation through vehicles like securitizations. And one of the key questions that we're going to have to address as we think about global architecture is whether we need the equivalent of deposit insurance to attract wholesale funding to drive credit creation. In the past, to drive securitization and credit creation, we relied on rating agencies to arbitrate the cycle and arbitrate the market. Looking forward, it's unlikely that rating agencies are going to be able to serve the same function and therefore, we're going to have to think about different mechanisms to drive these, as these types of credit creation mechanisms. Let me go back to the insurance structure and let me just leave that with you as a suggestion. Any insurance-based program is likely to provide more checks and balances to deal with complex markets, much more so than any rating agencies can. And we may need a long-term insurance structure around money markets or around mortgages as they have in Canada where these are government-sponsored insurance structures. The goal, of course, is to design a system that will allow markets to clear and that will allow GDP to grow at an optimal rate. We can all agree that there aren't enough deposits in the world to fund optimal GDP growth. And a safety net for wholesale funding markets developed in a global coordinated way may be an answer. To do this, though, we need global coordination. Let me talk about global coordination. Of course, we need to recognize that globalization continues to be a powerful force of nature. Free trade and international capital flow still offer the same promise of expanding global wealth and improving social welfare as they always have. And I firmly believe this. It couldn't be clearer to me that the financial crisis was not caused solely by complexity or globalization. The crisis also happened because we did not build the rails to cope with the new high-speed trains. The principles of global coordination are straightforward. They are uniformity of approaches to market structure, strong linkages between central banks throughout the world, well-capitalized clearing houses throughout the world, consistent rules for capital, accounting, foreign exchange, etc., that promote global capital flows without hindrance. I mentioned earlier that we at Citi intend to be leaders in creating the new regulatory framework. Despite the disappointments and turmoils we have faced for more than a year, I believe we're going to play an important role in restoring the global balance, global financial architecture, and global economic growth. Our core mission at Citi is to enable capital to flow around the world and to stimulate economic growth. In these times, Cross-border capital flows from savings-rich economies to savings-short economies are going to be essential to restart global economic growth. There is no question about that. No financial institution in the world is as well positioned to provide these services as city. We operate in 109 nations with more than 8 out of every 10 employees working in their home countries. We are a unique franchise with an operating model that allows us to be both very local and very global. Many others talk about this, but we actually do it. One of the most immediate challenges in the global economy is to keep global markets open and accessible for trade and investment in this period. For the 30 OECD countries alone, total exports in 2007 amounted to 11 trillion US dollars and imports reached 11 and a half trillion US dollars. Before I conclude, I've talked to you today about the three critical issues I believe we all need to face for the next generations 
financial architecture. One is regulation. The second is financial architecture to drive credit creation. And the last point being global coordination. I said at the beginning that we're still in very early stages of creating a global regulatory system, an effort that could still fall short of an effective solution. But I must say I'm optimistic. We have a better understanding now of the causes of the extreme dislocation and disruption. And understanding the causes will enable us to move quickly towards a rebuilt system. Each of us remembers history in the context of our generation and our education. Many aspects of what we're going through today, the first global recession in 60 years, are not that unusual. What we learn time after time is that the answers to crises of these magnitude often have a common thread. The answers are discovered and implemented through the collective genius of dedicated intellectual capital. So for all the outstanding students that are here today, I want to extend an invitation. In the global financial industry, and certainly at Citi, we're searching for the best and brightest of your generation. We're eager for you to participate in this historic process of reform and revitalize the global financial markets. How well or how poorly the global financial markets are reshaped is in both of our generation's hands. So Howard, I appreciate this opportunity to come here and speak with all your outstanding students. I thank you very much. Should we hear what's on their minds and take some questions? Come down. Thank you. That's great. As you said um, uh, in the first part of your speech when you were talking about the um, accounting issues and the problems um, of having different types of accounting applying to different sides of the balance sheet. And you said that one model that didn't work was when you had uh, deposits, or particularly retail deposits, you know, funding tradable assets on the other side. But is that, uh, if you take that argument to its logical conclusion, is that not in fact an argument for a new Glass-Steagall and for saying that the universal banks uh, that have been built up should in fact be broken up because there's just no way that you can create a, an accounting or sensible environment in which you can have those assets and liabilities held together. Mm -hmm. Let's go back and think about banks for a minute. And I'll talk about um, how I think about running a bank and what the key issues are. And then we can talk a little bit about Glass-Steagall. And I think it wasn't necessarily the repeal of Glass-Steagall, but it was the sort of the inadequacy of the regulatory structure following the repeal that probably got us into a lot of issues we got into here. Let's think about a bank. What does a bank do? As you rightly pointed out, we take deposits, we get some wholesale funding on top of that, and take all that money and put it to work by investing in assets. You certainly want to make sure when you put all that money to work in assets, you do it in a diversified way. We found out historically that Banks that take deposits and wholesale funding and put it all to work in, say, Houston in the U.S., particularly Houston real estate, well, that model didn't work because there's so much concentration. And when Houston real estate turns, you've got a problem. Through this cycle, we've all realized what, that as a bank, when you take your deposits and your wholesale funding and put it all to work against U.S. real estate, broadly speaking, that hasn't worked either. And so the fundamental principle of running a bank is not only do you need to take, uh, raise deposits and wholesale funding, but you must put it to work in a diversified way across all sorts of asset classes. And if you take that to your logical extreme, it shouldn't only be loans. It shouldn't only be real estate loans, consumer loans, or bank loans. You should have the proper asset class diversification and geographical diversification that you would need for any endowment, any foundation, any other system. So it makes sense from our perspective to have the ability to take deposits and wholesale funding and put that to work in asset classes across equities, fixed income, currencies, commodities, loans, credit, across all of these around the world because by doing that correctly will create a more stable banking structure. If you were to do that, 
you'd have to trade equities, you'd have to trade credit, you'd have to trade those things, which is therefore the repeal of Glass-Steagall Act. It makes sense for banks to do that. It isn't necessarily the principle of it. It's a question of how do you implement it? How do you execute against it? And I think what happened over the last five years, thanks to certain uh, central bank policies, because interest rates were coming down, it became clear to a lot of people that you could actually buy any asset any asset class, just hang on to it, and you made money because all assets went up in price. And it generated in our language what is known as a carry trade. A lot of companies got carried away with the carry trade. Uh, and uh, the net result of that is some of the stuff you're seeing. So I wanted to take uh, a few minutes to explain to you sort of the architecture of what a bank is. It really isn't so much about Glass-Steagall or not. As a matter of fact, Glass-Steagall didn't exist outside of the U.S. anywhere in the world. So why does that make sense in the U.S.? It's not about that. It's really about how do you run a bank. And I do think that's one of the reasons why a new regulatory architecture is really important to make sure that we have the right kind of asset liability management for the least amount of risk going forward. The, 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 thank you for that. And the second point you made was about the level playing field. I'm always slightly nervous about this analogy because if there were level playing fields, why did teams change ends at half time? But this is a philosophical question. Um, uh, but the, 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 <laughs> the, the question that I really pose on that, which I think you're particularly uh, interesting position to answer, because you, you went uh, on a kind of night's move from Morgan Stanley to Citibank via um, a hedge fund, which is kind of hopping out of the regulatory structure and then hopping I've back done into it all. It. You've done it all. Okay. But, so you've hopped out and you've hopped right. back. The, in the middle of this crisis, of course, right. the regulatory structure has changed because yes. uh, you know, the investment banks such as us still exist and now bank holding companies. If you, and, and it's quite clear that becoming a bank holding company uh, you know, is going to involve reduction in leverage. I mean, that's uh, inherent in this and indeed le leverage of institutions like yours is being cut back. So. What does that imply for the institutions outside that regulated frontier? Do we really have a level playing field? Or in fact, the problems that we've experienced recently in regulated institutions, are they now going to reappear on the other side in the hedge fund sector or in the private equity unless we extend the regulatory reach to cover them? So have we got a stable frontier of regulation now? Uh, that is the question. Uh, the question we need to ask is how wide a net do we need to cast? What kind of institutions do we need to pick up? And there are two sets of issues here. The first set of issues is, uh, relates to the fact that entire sectors of the securitization market and entire large finance companies like GE Capital, et cetera, were unregulated. But they served some of the same functions that banks do. They made loans, except they didn't make loans by funding them with deposits. They made loans by acquiring wholesale funding to make those loans. When there are systemic issues, they are just as important systemically as any other regulated, regulated institution. As a matter of fact, having a large unregulated financial sector without a level playing field for rules like capital accounting, what it does is drives that sector to drive pricing in the market at such a level that it affects the regulated sector. So there is an externality that is imposed by the unregulated sector on the regulated sector, which makes this question really important. Now, I think that's why I said when you look at when you're in times of stress, it isn't about large institutions being systemically important. Even the smaller ones are. I, I believe there was some <coughs> belief maybe Lehman wasn't systemically important, but look what happened. So as you think about this, you have to think about size, scope, casting the wide net, not only in the context of what is large, what is small, what is meaningful systemically and in good times, but what is that answer in bad times. I suspect that picks up a lot of institutions, a lot of different kinds of companies, and you must do that because if one of the roles of the regulators is to clear markets by getting at information that markets cannot get at by their own, on their own, you need to have that information content in there. I think that's sort of the, 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 the part on that. The biggest question in the marketplace, though, is we don't know what this unregulated uh, system is going to look like because the unregulated financial system did not work on taking deposits. They worked on wholesale funding. It is safe to say, again, 
that there are three sources of really credit creation. As I said, banks, finance companies, and securitization markets. The second two have been curtailed dramatically, and the reason is it's not clear exactly what the wholesale funding mechanism is going to be uh, for the next generation that's going to support these. So in some ways, where we are today and the nature of the wholesale funding markets might in themselves limit that unregulated activity anyway. Thanks. Well, let me <coughs> open it up since my rights as a customer have, uh, I think, been uh, used up. Uh, guy with a <laughs> pink uh, tie, about fifth, fifth or sixth row up. Yeah. The, no, the, no, no, the, the well-dressed gentleman yeah. with the, with the <coughs> okay. pink tie. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Dimitri. I'm a second-year economic student at LSE. Um, thank you very much for your talk, Mr. Uh, Pandit. Um, you've mentioned that um, you see that the short-term steps targeting the uh, credit creation will be necessary before we reach this new financial um, system, financial paradigm. But clearly there, is a, there are great dangers lying in these short-term steps, and one of them being the politicians, not only in the States, but also in this country and other countries, trying to appease their voters by bringing them back their ability to overborrow in credit cards and get the houses on 100% mortgages, etc. Um, would you say that, and clearly that would be disastrous uh, for the world economy and for the United States especially, uh, would you say that you as a person face a strong political criticism pretty much on a daily basis in Washington. Would you say that politicians in the States are willing uh, to engage in this quest and not make the mistakes, not bring the past back and reach the new solution uh, for the American economy and the world economy? Thank you. There is no question we live in a political economy and uh, we just need to read the newspapers every day to understand that. Uh, I do genuinely believe that when you look at America, uh, every branch of the government, every uh, politician is actually really asking the questions about what is right for America. The problem comes about if there is ever a problem because not everybody has the same idea about what is right for America and therein lies the debate. Uh, but the debate uh, is pretty much around tactics rather than goals of what we need to do. Uh, and Sometimes it may look, it may look uh, like we may be taking too long or there may be points of view expressed uh, uh, to sometimes just vent the anger and frustration that people are feeling in the economy, but ultimately we get to the right answer. And, uh, and uh, I guess the best phrase to me that I've used unfortunately too often with too many governments around the world being in 109 countries is that the Americans, uh, Winston Churchill said this, Americans wind up doing the right thing, but only after exhausting every other alternative. <laughs> uh, who's next? Yeah, third row. Percy. Uh, I know you've talked about the lack of regulatory oversight. Um, I just wanted to just read something to you which I was, came across in the FT today, which I thought was particularly amusing. It was in the FT of yesterday. The head of the UK Financial Investments is a chap called John Kingman. He looks after the bank stakes, which the UK government now has. Um, and in defense of the frugality of the UK uh, FIs, of uh, business activities, his chairman yesterday said, I just want you to note that Kingman was paid less than John Thane's chauffeur. Now, the point I'm trying to make down here is, do you think it's fair and reasonable that a regulator should be so poorly paid? Uh, and I speak in defense here of Harvard. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, uh, as opposed to the management of the sort of banks he does regulate, he or she does regulate, because from time to time you may have an imbalance in quality, here I don't speak about Howard, between the regulator and the bank in question. And the second thing which we, on, on the whole regulatory framework is, you know, you touched on it yourself, you looked at GE Capital a few years ago, you look what happened to, to their spreads then because of the mismatch between CP paper, which they were funding on, and their asset package. You look at the likes of an AIG, which is a hedge fund in disguise, and arguably regulated by an insurance regulator who knows next to nothing about credit derivatives and the like. You look at Porsche today, which is a hedge fund in disguise too. So by and large, doesn't the regulator have a terribly difficult job? Because as you've touched on, well, he's probably not very well paid. He's probably not very well funded. Uh, there are corporates which get around that. And worst of all, I mean, look at your own bank in question. You have management teams who've been paid an awful lot of money who haven't really done their job terribly well. I suspect a lot of the latter people are gone from where we are. Um, but let's step back. I do think 
that we need to think, rethink compensation. I really do think we need to do that um, on all fronts. Clearly, in, in, on Wall Street and the financial institutions, uh, we've made mistakes. Uh, it hasn't been perfect. It's been not long-term enough. Um, uh, it didn't have things like clawbacks for the right behavior, et cetera. Um, and so I couldn't agree with you more. We have to rethink compensation in a much more broader way. I'd also add to you that not everybody works um, uh, uh, in public service solely for the purpose of money as well, as we know. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and as we know in the U.S. as well, um, as a matter of fact, uh, some of the best people decide that's really what they want to do. Uh, but I completely appreciate what you're saying uh, and completely understand that if we're going to go to this framework, which says let's let markets clear, give them as much transparency as possible to clear, but also let's have an overarching regulator because not everything is transparent and they need to act as the clearing body that you need to have the talent. We all need to think about that. Who's next? Yeah, uh, man about sixth row, um, moustache, well, beard. <coughs> yeah. Hi, Vikram. I used to work for Smith Barney in New York till fall last year. Thanks for coming to London. Thank you. Uh, the first question is, uh, the cost of compliance for a bank in the US when there are multiple overlapping regulators, like OCC, OTS, then Federal Reserve's supervisory arm, have you communicated this and how painful it is for a bank with multiple regulators, unlike FSA in the UK? That's one. And second, why did we sell Smith Barney? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. All right. You know, th that's an awkward question given that one of the directors of Morgan Stanley is right here. <laughs> and, and we did not sell Smith Barney. We, we thought both these companies could enjoy synergies by having a more efficient organization with greater scale if we did it, put them together rather than selling them. Um, That's what we thought too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, what, what can I tell you? I love all my regulators, okay? Um, um, I, the point is not has not gone unnoticed, and frankly, I don't need to talk about it or say anything about it. It is clear that when you look at the U.S., the, the multiple regulators each looking at slice with their own sort of uh, goals and their own dispatch um, can, in, in turn, cause friction in getting to the right answers, which is part of some of the previous question we talked about in the political economy. Uh, it's not only about politicians, but when you have multiple regulatory agencies, getting them all aligned same place, that's not an easy job either because uh, everybody has their own objectives per se. I am hoping quite seriously, and I would be quite optimistic about this as a matter of fact, when we get to the other side of this, we'll resolve a lot of these issues. Yeah, front, uh, front row. My name is Alan. I'm a third year student in the LSE. Um, one of the things that uh, this crisis exposes is that we, not only do we have institutions which are too big to fail, we actually have institutions that are too big to be saved, um, especially in the UK, in Switzerland, or in, in countries where, say, Ireland, where the assets of uh, the banking sector clearly uh, exceed the GDP mass many times. Um, what do you think is the long-term solution to this problem uh, in terms of uh, how do we make sure that we have banks that are capable of... Um, serving the global economy, but are not too big to be saved by the um, national government or fiscal authorities. Thank you. I think that's, that's probably, I would say, that's one of the most fundamental issues that's, that has to be thought through, um, because you can understand the reaction to that question can go a variety of different ways. Some ways it can go can actually hinder the process of globalization and free trade, et cetera. There are other ways it can go which can actually make these banks even better. I'm a firm believer, by the way, that nothing's going to stop globalization. You may have some friction here or there, and that globalization only works on global rails, and we provide them at City, and that we need banks that, through their own internal clearing, clearing payments and other systems, can transfer money around the world and make sure that they serve companies in the countries they are in. That's a necessity to, to serve global commerce. Um, 
I think it's a big issue, but that issue, I suppose, has a similar answer to the Glass-Steagall issue in many ways. It isn't about the architecture. It's about what the goals were and how somebody ran that. And so you take some banks that may have, uh, uh, if you have $4 of assets and you only had $1 of deposits to function, the four, uh, to, the, to serve the $4 of assets, then you had $3 of wholesale funding. That's not truly a bank in its classical form. That doesn't go to the statement of, of whether or not they should be global. It goes to the statement of, is that a way to run a bank? Is that what you want to do? Uh, what we do around the world, you go to Mexico, you go to India, you go to Poland, you go to Korea, we run a bank on the ground that's asset liability matched and capitalized in a way that the local regulators look at it and say, it's a local bank. It's, it's well capitalized, it's working as if it's their bank. Uh, and then we connect the world on top of that. So there are some basic principles to how you run a bank, which is in many countries. Now, we happen to have done it, um, I shouldn't say 200 years, but at least for about 110, 125 years, exactly doing it that way correctly. So I do believe a lot of that is about execution. A lot of that is about the architecture by which you run a bank. And for that, to make sure banks have the right architecture, the preferred solution to me is, a be is better regulatory oversight that guides the banks to the right asset liability management framework. Uh, yeah, so guy um, in white uh, near the back there, third row down. Thomas Pye, postgraduate student in economics. Two very short questions. Uh, what is your unbiased estimate of the day on which city will be nationalized? Second, what is your unbiased estimate on which date would be optimal for me to buy city shares? <laughs> <laughs> well. Well, if, if, if the first occurs, the second would be precluded, right? <laughs> so it's a path-dependent question, as uh, <laughs> only an economist can ask. Um, <laughs> um, so what can I say uh, that hasn't already been said by uh, the Treasury Secretary, by Ben uh, Bernanke at the, at the Fed, uh, by Sheila Baer at the FDIC, for that matter, by Larry Summers, by the president. The goal is not nationalization. The goal r starts by recognizing that the world has a, some serious economic issues. And in those, in that environment, you need stable banking, uh, you need a stable banking system and you need credit creation. And what has become obvious to everybody is that when you have assets of the kind any bank does and you go through the economic environment of the sort you're going through today, that that causes a lot of stress and that having a stable, viable banking system requires support, not only support in the form of capital, which has been provided in the U.S. and here, but really, you know, it's liquidity support, it's funding support. You know, if I need to issue commercial paper, I can go to the Fed, and so can every other bank in the U.S. If I need liquidity against my assets, I can take it in as collateral and get liquidity against it. If I need to raise long-term funding, I have an FDIC guarantee. Uh, I could probably take this chair in and I'd get some money for it as well. <laughs> so fundamentally, whether you call it nationalized, socialized support, er, just about every large financial institution in the U.S., for that matter, many financial institutions in the world, are operating because of the largest of either central banks or governments. That's where we are. And the real question in the minds of everybody is how do you get from here to there? Because here to there is going to get, take some time. What's the best way of doing that? And for that, they have articulated some very simple principles. You cannot be a capitalist uh, economy and have nationalized banks. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, so free market, private capital, banks that work uh, correctly, franchise value of banks, all those things are important. And the role of the government is to lend a helping hand to get from here to there. In turn, all of us have to do exactly what we always do, be systemically responsible, make sure, we, uh, make sure we understand the role of the support that's given to us, et cetera. I think that's sort of where we are. Um, and, uh, and I really don't know what nationalization means, because to have funding support from FDIC could count as nationalization, or to have no shares outstanding, the government owns a bank, could be counted as nationalization. These are shades of gray. Let us admit 
and make sure we all understand the new reality, which is to say the banking system is supported by both the central bank and the government in the U.S. There was one. <laughs> um, well, you know, the shares have been cheap for a very long period of time. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Are you authorized to give financial advice? <laughs> In this jurisdiction. Yeah. I, I highly suggest you talk to your financial advisor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, it was a guy in the middle, uh, the, yeah, the, um, with a sort of, I don't know what to describe that, I can't really see what it is. <laughs> sort of. Yeah, but whatever it is, looks great. Looks, yeah, greeny, brown, that's it, yeah, you, that's it. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Edward Huang, uh, second year student here. Um, do, you, do you not think that this idea of the new sort of global infrastructure would create for an unrealistic or somewhat unreasonable expectations gap between regulators and banks? I mean, I don't think you can really go to any government, government or even big four accounting firm and ask them to run an efficient sort of risk optimization model, right? I mean, would you suggest something like a quasi-public firm like the Fed? But we all know, you know, how well that worked. Um, Greenspan could even stay with the Taylor rule. Come on. Let's start by admitting that there are no perfect solutions and that this is always a journey, it's not a destination. We also need that, we also know that free markets capitalism isn't necessarily the best system, but it's better than any other alternatives that we have. We start with those constraints and in, within those constraints we have to design systems which starts with markets. Markets are very good arbiters, by the way. They can be. Again, if they have a lot of information to do the analysis, they usually come to a pretty good answer. You have to design markets that work, but when there are markets that don't have a chance of clearing, you need regulators to step in. That doesn't mean optimization models necessarily, but that means understanding things like levers that regulators have, capital, leverage, accounting. I mean, there are lots of levers that regulators have to make sure that you get to a systemically responsible way. Now, you know, ideally, we'd have, as you economists would know, complete markets. You know what complete markets are here? Sort of? Okay. All right. Anyway, go, go look it up if you don't know. Ideally, you'd have complete markets. You don't have complete markets. And when you don't have complete markets, you need some overarching architecture to step in and do it. it with all its issues, all its foibles, all its fallacies, it's still the best alternative we have. We'll take uh, one more, I guess, yeah. Um, it's such right. Akshil Chain, well, second year undergraduate in economics. Uh, one of the means of uh, bringing back uh, trust and confidence in the system is bringing back trust and confidence in what companies and business leaders say. Uh, we had Lehman and Bear saying, we're fine and we figured out they weren't. We had GE saying we're not going to cut our dividend, and then they did. We had Citi saying we're well capitalized by tier one, and then saying, oh, sorry, it's TCE instead. Uh, so how do we bring about trust in what you say and the words and uh, in, in the long run? The issue of trust and confidence is about the entire economy, and it's about the entire financial system. That's really the place to start. And the fact of the matter is that we talk, you know, we can talk a lot about the economic policies that are in place, which are pretty good, by the way. They're very comprehensive. I think they're going to work. But fundamentally, the, the task ahead of all of us is to restore trust and confidence. And what, you're, what, what you find is that at the end of the day, uh, the markets today are so tentative and so sort of uh, so, uh, so unsure of themselves that they're not the ones that are providing the confidence necessarily to the marketplace. But having said that, market activity can drive confidence down in institutions. And so what you, what you look at when you look at the sort of the, the effects that have been occurring out there is not so much the economics of the issue. The economics are you have enough capital. The economics are tier one capital is more than enough and it should work. As a matter of fact, when you talk to long holders of common stock, they'll tell you that. Okay. On the other hand, the fact is that if the market goes the other way, 
and says, really, you know, that's not good enough. We need something else and drives your stock price down, which in turn create creates an issue of confidence in your company, then you act to defend it. So I guess what I'm saying there is that it is almost impossible for any institution to stand up on its own and create that confidence. The confidence is about confidence in the financial system, and that's not going to come from the markets. Ultimately, what all the markets recognize is that there is a giant actor out there called the government and the central bank that is going to be critical to this economic recovery and critical to the stability and the fate of the financial system. Ultimate confidence is going to come from what they say. Not much has been said, although they have started. Bernanke said that, Bear, Sheila Baer said that, they started building confidence in financial systems in the U.S. But I suppose one of the steps that's going to be important to see if they draw a line in the sand is the stress test they've been talking about. Looking at all the banks, applying a stress test, looking at you know, how, how much capital do you need? Do you have enough? Do you need more? Are you going to have enough to go through a stressful situation over the next two years and still be well capitalized on the other side? This probably is really the first attempt by the regulators and the government to say, we're going to apply the same yardstick to every bank. And on the other side of that, we'll top off banks if they need to be topped off or not. But at that point, everybody is on a level playing field in terms of capital based on what the stress test shows for the next two years. That, to me, is going to be a fundamental a fundamental uh, a time to see whether that starts restoring confidence in the financial system as, as a whole. Most of the time, what you find is that when one bank is attacked, it isn't only about the bank, it is about every other bank. And the dominoes are very important, so the issue of confidence has to be handled together. And I'm looking forward to the stress test. I'm looking forward to the output of that. I think that becomes really, it probably could be a turning point for establishing confidence in the financial system. Thank you. Um, we're going to have to uh, stop there because um, I just caught uh, the eye of Danny Qua, the head of our economics department, who's going to deliver a lecture on complete markets here starting in five minutes' time. <laughs> Good. Um, and, uh, uh, but in the meantime, uh, we uh, know that you must be really quite busy. Um, and it's therefore particularly pleasing that you should spend a bit of time coming and talking to our students about the problems of the bank, and also, of course, about the future of the regulatory system. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.